All right, a little bit about myself. Uh, Dave was talking about, about me a little bit. I actually started beekeeping in Oregon in 2003. Right after high school, I decided that I was going to be a commercial beekeeper. Uh, we had a commercial beekeeper down the road, and um, I would stop by there periodically and talk to him, and I thought that was a good plan. So I started researching, which I, re I uh, recommend everybody do when you get started beekeeping. Um, go check out everything, because it's, it's really a bad time when I get... I had a good friend from church, like a good friend, like someone who I go over to their house and, and eat their food and um, see at church every week. and. She comes to me one morning at church and says, hey, my bees are going to be here on Tuesday. Could you help me install them? And I said, I, this is news to me. I'm an I'm a experienced beekeeper. I could have really helped you get into this and maybe uh, help you with your decisions getting started. And, you know, I consider myself an educator. That's what I want to do. So I went over and helped her install the bees and came over and helped her a couple times during the year getting her bees started and learning how to keep bees. But uh, come October, she called me and said, the bees are dead, come get the hive, you can have it. And uh, I was, I don't want to see that. And, and honestly, I don't want your hive because it's eight frame and I have 10 frame. <laughs> um, so I have, I have, patterned everything that I do in order to uh, educate the new beekeeper, especially. Um, old beekeepers don't need any education, they know everything. So I'm trying to help new bee beekeepers get started so that they can be successful. And by successful, I don't just mean keep bees alive. I mean keep keeping bees and keep enjoying what they're doing. So if that means following an alternate model, a different way of keeping bees. Um, I'm into that. If you if you're the type of person that never wants to get in the hive, you just want to have like a log in the yard with bees in it. That's great. We can do that too. There's no reason why you have to stick to a specific style, and there's no reason why you have to go with Langstroth style hives either. There are a lot of hive options for people who are looking to keep bees in a different way. But I'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> Um, so I started out in 2003. In 2005, I moved to Arkansas. I met my wife. She was working at the uh, um, Walmart home office there in Bentonville. Uh, and so I went out to be with her because I didn't have a great job and she was going to put me through college. So that was great. I spent eight years in college, have a master's degree in civil engineering, and can't find a job. Um, so I'm doing beekeeping. Uh, I've been beekeeping this whole time as a hobby, even more than a hobby. So when, uh, so when I was unable to find a job where I am now, I thought, why not try and expand with my beekeeping and teach other people what I know and what I'm doing. So this picture right here is from Colorado. We moved to Colorado where I was working as an engineer for about a year. Um, you can't really tell. Well, you can tell. You can see the sand. This is basically a desert out in the middle of Colorado, north of Denver. And once a year, it looks like this. But the rest of the year, it looks like that. So a lot of mice get into the hives. I, I, uh, I like to say that I developed mice-proof bees. Um, I don't even remember how many dead mice I found in the hives. The bees would just kill them. So that was interesting. Uh, then um, after I worked there. I moved back to Oregon, in my hometown, where I have my family. Um, I started volunteering to do talks like this. Started developing talks, developing methods for people to get started keeping bees and stay keeping bees. So that's why I'm here today. This is my first full day event. I've only the most I've done before is two hours at a time. And I apologize for my voice. I came down with a, with a light head cold a couple of days ago before I got on the airplane. And so I'm trying to take it easy with my voice and not overdo it, so I hope you can hear me. I know I'm a little soft-spoken. I've got some green tea here with uh, Dave's honey. It's very delicious. Hope to keep my throat working. 
So let's start out. Oh, and uh, just as a moment, uh, note of, of how this is going to work, feel free to raise your hand and ask questions at any time. Uh, this first talk is my longest one, so it might go a little over the, uh, the time limit for that, but like Dave said, we're flexible. Um, I've got a couple of things more to talk about. I'll be here all day. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. Like I said, I'm an educator, especially for new beekeepers. Um, the interesting thing, uh, when I was down in, down in Arizona for the organically managed beekeeping conference this last week, we got talking about new beekeepers and, and young beekeepers, and I said, these days, new beekeepers aren't young beekeepers. I mean, I don't know if you, you look around, you can see the average age is, is not uh, high school. The average age is a professional working person. And um, that's, that's the nature of beekeeping today. I see that with everybody. So actually, a person who starts like me right out of high school is the rarity. So I'm here for you, especially those of you who are new, first or second year. So I'm, I'm open for anything you want to ask, and I'll be here until all your questions are answered, until they kick us out of the building, one or the other. All right, my first talk, you'll find I like to come up with uh, funny titles. The first talk's called Let Them Die, The Case for Doing It the Hard Way. Um, so this is my, my reason for keeping bees treatment free and the reason why I think you should also keep bees treatment free. If you don't keep bees treatment free and don't have any intention to do so, that's fine. Just, just, um, just listen and, and see what I'm up to. And if you like it, you can do it that way. And if not, don't worry about it. I'm not here to argue with anybody. I'm not here to try and convert anybody. Um, my Facebook group is uh, we've got about 14,000 members now, treatment-free beekeepers, and we are not at all interested in arguing. We're interested in beekeeping. So that's what I'm here to, to talk about. So what, is, what does treatment-free beekeeping mean? Um, a few years back, I came up with a, a definition for treatment-free beekeeping for the Bee Source Forum, which I was a part of at the time. And we kind of crowdsourced a definition, figured out what the people, what the users of the forum wanted to, how they wanted to define it. And so we came up with a definition that was something like, uh, treatment is anything that we put in the hive to help the bees deal with a pest or a sickness or a malady or whatever. Something that we put in the hive to help them. Um, so that includes anything basically. Any, any of the traditional treatments, miticides and things, or even the softer stuff like um, essential oils or powdered sugar. We really want the bees to deal with the problems themselves. And so, uh, that, and that came out of the idea from organic beekeeping, which was, um, when I started back in 2003, organic beekeeping was kind of what we called it. Because back, in, back then, organic wasn't specifically legally defined for by the FDA, but now it is. And because of the requirements uh, that you keep your that you keep your bees in an area where there's no influence of pesticides anywhere, it's almost impossible to be a true organic beekeeper because bees fly for miles and miles, and so you can't control where they go. So after that, I after that became legally defined, I, we were looking for a while to what to call it, and I I started with all natural beekeeping and then I realized that um, if we put bees in a box that's not natural so kind of dropped that one and then came upon treatment free beekeeping because I can't control what the bees do but I can control what I do and what I put in the hive and I can decide not to put things in the hive. Um, we also there's still still a discussion on what feeding should be involved um, I try not to feed as much as possible. I don't feed absolutely unless bees need it. So um, when I was in Arkansas, for instance, I could raise nukes in the spring, raise hives up to full-size hives through the summer without feeding because there was plenty of nectar to be had. Uh, Colorado and Oregon are not that way because they have a, a harsher summer. Um, so. 
I normally don't feed my hives, uh, established hives I don't feed unless it's in the winter and unless I need to make sure that my hives survive. Like right now I'm trying to build back from uh, cutting down my numbers so I could move. You know I only have a 4 by 8 trailer so there's only so many hives you can fit on that. So what I would do is I would combine the weak ones and allow the very weak ones to die so that I get down my numbers and then move and then I had to move again and so I'm coming back. Um, and in the, the winter, I only feed granulated sugar. And there's a couple reasons. Number one, there's no robbing. Number two, the bees only get into the sugar when they run out of everything else. And in fact, in the spring, when they get back to flowers again, they will leave the sugar. And so by then it's solidified, I just take it out of the hive, throw it in a bucket, leave it there and use it next year. So they don't eat it unless they really need it. And that's my philosophy with feeding. Because if we, f if, if we look at feeding as a treatment, we can, if, if we're feeding our bees just to keep them alive, and we have to keep doing that every year, that is a treatment, right? It's treating against starvation. And we don't want that. We want bees that survive on their own, right? We have them in a hive. They're supposed to get honey and bring it back here, nectar, make it into honey. and. Um, I, I like to tell people they're not rabbits, they're not in a cage. They're, they're, they're semi-wild animals and they're supposed to feed themselves. And if we have enough hives, in a normal year when I was up in the, the 20 or 30 range, um, I didn't bother feeding at all. And if a hive was unable to bring in enough honey to support itself, that's that. Uh, I wanted bees that were able to survive without me in case something happened to me. Right, if I break, I, uh, this picture right here, um, I rode out there on my motorcycle one day to check on the bees and I hit a mud puddle and flipped the bike over and it landed on my foot and broke my foot and I couldn't do anything for two months. But the bees were fine because there was no treating or feeding needed. So that's, that's we're creating bees that create clean honey. We all want clean honey. But that's not our goal. The organic, the idea of organic is that you're creating clean food and that's good. But the idea of treatment free is that you're creating solid animals, solid wild animals, so that when they get away, they're not going to die. The clean honey is just a nice side effect. So that's my focus. I want to make that clear. Um, I like to think of it as a We've all seen on the Discovery Channel or Nature or wherever the, the Serengeti. You know, you got your uh, cheetahs and gazelles, right? They're, cheetahs are really fast running animal, gazelles are really fast running animal. And there's kind of a, an eternal arms race going on, right? We get a faster gazelle, we need a faster cheetah to catch up. Faster cheetah catches up, eats all the slow gazelles, only the fast gazelles survive. Um, we can call this natural selection, but I don't want to get stuck on the word natural because anything we do is selection, right? Um, I was born via C-section, cesarean section, right? I was too big to come out naturally. But the fact that I survive is a selection for people that cannot be born naturally. Now. I make a big distinction between humans and bees. I'm a human. I have little humans that are my humans. And I think humans are important and have uh, inherent value. Bees are insects. They are, some people consider them agricultural livestock. So I can, the other thing is a human takes 15 years to be able to reproduce, a bee can reproduce in a month. So there's a huge difference between breeding bees and the importance we place on humans. We are, I've heard recently, heard it said that we are self-domesticating. We are domesticating ourselves. We have created a culture in which natural selection doesn't really take place anymore. Right? We have medicine to keep us alive when we should die. That's just a fact of life. Um, we must not apply that model to bees. 
we have, we've tried over the years to do that with treatments and things. And uh, as we've seen with CCD and other diseases, um, in protest, the bees die. They can't survive that way. And the feral population does pretty well. You know, I tell people when, when, the, when they tell me the bees are dying, what can we do? It's like, well, the bees aren't really dying. The bees in hives are dying. The bees out in the trees are doing fine. I want to form a method that's about the bees out in the trees. Keep bees in my hives that would do just as well in trees as they do with me. Maybe a little better with me because I'm going to manage them and try and get them to make more honey. Um, so we're always under adaptation. When we treat bees, we create bees that need treatments. That's a very important point. If we don't let the ones die that can't survive without treatment, then we are creating bees that need treatment. Not only that, but when we treat against mites or foul brood or, or other diseases, we create diseases that are strong because they need to survive the treatments to pass on their genetics to the next generation. Okay, so when we treat, we create strong diseases and weak bees. That's my case. Um, so with, with treatment-free, again, we come back to the, the cheetah and the gazelle. If the gazelle is too fast, then the cheetah doesn't eat and the cheetah dies. If the cheetah's too fast, then they're gonna breed up exponentially and they're gonna eat all the gazelle and then they're not, they're not gonna have anything to eat and they're gonna die. So a proper uh, predator and host relationship in nature is one in which the predator remains a small population and the prey remains a big population. So the predator is gonna just eat the few of the big population that are the least fast. Right, what's the old joke? If you're, if you're running away from a bear, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun your friend. <laughs> it's like that. Um, so with, with bees and mites, we have the same situation, right? We want, we want mites that don't exist. Unfortunately, we can't have that. That's not the situation we have. So we want bees that have mites but keep them to a minimum, right? Like, uh, what's a good example? Wax moths. Uh, 200 years ago, wax moths were called the bee wolf. They, were, they would come into hives and they would just decimate hives, like, um, like hive beetles have done in some places. They just overrun the hive. But today, wax moths are seen as something that just eats your comb when you're, when you're not looking, right? If you have an empty hive, uh, empty box sitting in somewhere in the dark. Generally, wax moths do not overrun healthy hives. And that's because there weren't treatments for wax moths back in the day. And eventually, the bees developed a natural predator-prey relationship with the wax moths. And so I'm saying we can do that with varroa mites. And those of us who've been keeping bees treatment-free for years, we've done that. Um, so we develop traits in bees. Uh, you, you've heard of them. You've probably seen them advertised. Uh, one of the ones that's going around popular right now is mite biters. So that's where the bees will actually actively chase the mites, bite them, maul them, and kill the mites, or just at least get them off. Um, there's also, you, you may have seen in, in hives with hygienic behavior, that's where the bees will chew out diseased brood, not only of mites, but also of foul brood and other diseases. Before the disease can completely develop, uh, the bees can chew out that larva and sacrifice that larva and keep the hive from becoming totally infested. And in fact, uh, there's a study out there, I think it was done by Marla Spivak, uh, about hygienic bees where she actually put, she infected hives with American fowl brood and hives that had high hygienic traits, a high level of hygienic traits as they're tested, were actually able to eliminate the fowl brood and go on with their life. 
Um, so foul brood among hygienic bees, it's not really a big problem. With my bees, I've never had a case of foul brood. Now it's still possible, I'm not saying I never will, but it's not a death sentence. It's not, um, in treatment-free beekeeping, the vast majority of people that I talk to that have been keeping bees treatment-free for years and years have never had a case of foul brood because uh, most of our bees develop hygienic traits and so they deal with that. Um, the other things we have is uh, grooming. Uh, actually, I've seen, you'll probably be seeing this in a couple of years, or not a couple of years, pretty soon. Uh, I've seen a video of a bee on a, uh, some type of fuzzy plant. I, I don't know, the, but you, you've seen plants, some herbs have kind of like hairs on their stems and they're kind of fuzzy. The bee is climbing all around that and trying to scrape the mite off. See, this is a behavior that we've only recently discovered because we don't see it in the hive and we don't wander around out in the woods looking for bees trying to clean mites off themselves. So who knows how long this trait has, has existed. And the important thing talking about all these traits is I'm not selecting for a specific trait. I'm leaving it up to the bees to come up with the trait to survive. Because when I select for a specific trait, like uh, you've seen breeding programs like in Louisiana, and they do line breeding and artificial insemination, and they come up with bees that have this incredibly stiff trait, like a hygienic trait. But in order to reproduce that on a mass scale, you have the, the mother queen for that, that's holding that trait that hive will chew out every cell of brood and will be unable to reproduce on its own. Um, so what they have to do is they have to keep putting new frames of brood in there to keep the hive up and then they'll use that queen to produce other queens and those queens will have a lesser amount of that trait and then they sell those as hygienic queens. Um, I don't think that's a good thing to do. It's like uh, breeding milk cows with udders so big that they drag the ground it's not useful. Um, and same thing with uh, turkeys. You know, today's turkeys that you'd buy for Thanksgiving or Christmas, they all have to be artificially inseminated because they've gotten so big that they can't mate on their own. I don't want bees that are like that. I, don't, I want bees that when I, if the end of the world happens, if, if, uh, if it hits the fan and, and humanity comes to an end, I'd like bees to still be around. I don't want them to be treated such that when we all die off, they all die off too because they're reliant on us to survive. So we have, when I was, uh, when I first started beekeeping and, and uh, treatment free was not a big thing. Uh, Michael Bush has been here before and uh, when I started, he had just finished his first winter where he didn't lose all his bees. So he was just, um, he's got 43 years of beekeeping experience, but he was still losing bees up until 2002. Um, when I started back then, the idea of be keeping bees treatment free was anathema to a lot of people. And it still is a little bit, but people invite me to do this now. So it's getting better, obviously. And Michael Bush as well. Um, they told us that there were no wolf resistant sheep. You couldn't develop wolf resistant sheep, so you can't develop mite resistant bees. Well, I eventually figured out that that's not exactly the case, is it? There are wolf resistant sheep. They're, they climb up mountains and, and have their babies where the wolves can't get to, or they have these big horns and they can butt things and defend themselves. But what's happened over thousands of years is we've taken these sheep from the mountains and we've domesticated them. Uh, we've bred them for long shaggy wool so we can make clothes. We've bed, bred them for uh, big fatty mussels so we can eat them. Um, and we've kept them in pens. And so the wolf can get into the pen fairly easily and kill the sheep. There, there are wolf resistant sheep, but we're keeping domesticated sheep and those two populations are different. And I, I the same thing is with bees. Um, and the examples of that, like I mentioned, are wax moths. Uh, also, American foul brood is a good example. American foul brood used to be a pretty horrible thing, and that's where everybody got the idea that we needed to burn hives with American foul brood. Oh, great, somebody's after me. 
I uh, have to deal with people on Facebook and um, when they decide they're not going to be civil I have to delete them from the group and uh, I let them take it out on me so that was what that message was about <laughs> I'd rather they take it out on me and uh, rather than the rest of our group because um, again I'm I'm not here to argue I'm just here to tell and the best the best argument that I have over beekeeping for as long as I have is that I'm still doing it and I'm still here I don't need to argue my case I can just show you my hives um, and unfortunately it pops up on both screens all right so American fowl brood how we dealt with it because it was such a bad disease when it first came out was we burned the hives uh, because it was so virulent and so it could spread so quickly and easily but we've come to the point today where uh, less than 5% and depending on what numbers you look at less than 1% of hives come down with an actual infection of American fowl brood a day but we know from from scientific studies that all hives have American fowl brood spores in the hive the bees have through natural selection bees in trees in the wild where fowl brood could crop up and also our selection because we destroy hives that have fowl brood so in both senses we eliminate the weak stock either in the feral hives where they are eliminated and die on their own or in our hives where we burn the hive and eliminate it that way that's a type of treatment free beekeeping that's been going on for a couple of centuries now um, and when American fowl brood has been introduced into other places like in uh, a few years ago it was introduced into northern Africa from uh, queens that were imported from France they got fowl brood horrifically um, they were just they, and they had no idea what it was because they hadn't had it before and they I've seen pictures where they're throwing throwing combs out on the ground and which is of course just increasing the problem because now other bees come and rob it and take it back to their hive so it, it and that follows the same progression that many populations do when a disease is introduced you'll have an initial die-off and then the the individuals from the population that can survive will then reproduce and whatever traits that they have that is their best selected for their environment they reproduce and they repopulate. This is a continual process that happens with um, every population. And we have things like this in human population too in the past when we had big plagues. Uh, you know, the, the Black Plague in Europe in the mid Middle Ages. That's a good example. It's a terrible, horrific thing. But not everybody died, right? Some people survived. Uh, you might have heard of the the woman who died in childbirth just a few weeks ago who was uh, who survived Ebola Ebola is one of the worst viruses that that plagues humans but um, maybe a quarter of people survive it and become immune to it um, if we write that large and if everybody got Ebola it would eventually be only the remaining uh, individuals would be immune to it and wouldn't have an Ebola problem anymore. I'm not recommending we do that with humans. I'm not a eugenicist. I believe humans are valuable. Um, the fact that we've domestic ourse domesticated ourselves is an entirely different issue. Um, but I want to make that, that distinction between humans and bees because the bees have already gotten the disease, right? They've already had Ebola. It was introduced in this country, um, depending on what numbers you look at, 20 to 30 years ago. And it spread throughout everywhere and it killed off colonies immediately before we developed treatments. So initially we did get into the right stage of the, the die off and then the rebuilding. But then we came up with treatments which, which took care of the mites um, for the bees. And the bees halted, uh, the, the kept bees, I like to make the distinction between kept bees and feral bees. The kept bees have become dependent on the treatments. The feral bees never were. There was a huge die-off. You might, uh, some people think that maybe even 95 or more percent of, of all the feral bees died off. But again, not all of them. 
because the bees that were immune to things like American fowl brood that had a similar trait that could be useful survived. And those traits have now become, have propagated through the feral population and we're getting better with them. Um, mite tests. I have people from time to time ask me about mite tests and I tell them that I don't do mite tests because again I'm not worried about which trait is important because any test is an analog. An analog is something that is like the thing you're looking for but it's not actually the thing you're looking for. So with mite tests we're testing depending on how you do it with uh, you're testing the, the amount of the number of bees that are have mites on them if you're doing like a, an alcohol test or a sugar shake or something or if you're you have a sticky board on the bottom of the hive you're testing the amount of mites that fall off the bees and land on the board. These are one way to check how many mites are in your hive but ultimately because of the mites life cycle you don't know how many mites are in your hive. Right, you have uh, mites that are in the cells, you have mites that are on the bees, you have mites that are crawling around so you don't really know. So there's no specific threshold that bees can survive with mites. Excuse me. Um, I see a lot when dealing with people who are trying to treat, trying to treat based on a mite load is better than just treating prophylactically because it's the same thing with uh, antibiotic resistance. When you treat ana with antibiotics all the time, whether it's needed or not, you develop resistance. You're going to develop resistance eventually anyway, but you develop resistance quicker when you treat prophylactically. Uh, so people think, okay, I do a mite test. How many mites should there be before I treat? It's a good question. Um, however, the number that's given is a number that I've found that most treatment-free hives can survive. I had this uh, one hive in I think 2011 and it was a good hive throughout the year, was fine. Uh, so I came to my final fall inspection in November and was looking through all the hives, make sure everything was, was ready to go, getting them battened down. Uh, and this hive, I opened it and I had never seen so many mites in a hive in my life. Uh, I could see bees crawling around with mites on them. I could see mites crawling on the comb all over the place. I looked in the, in, to the brood and I could see mites in the brood, like there was mites. And I thought, well, I'm a treatment-free beekeeper. This hive is a goner. The other 10 look great. Just close it up. Don't worry about it. We'll, uh, we'll take it apart next year and, you know, no problem. I had one hive die that winter out of 11 and it was not that one. I was absolutely amazed and that hive went on to, uh, to do some good work that year drawing comb. Um, the problem that we find is that our decisions on what is good enough, or the number of mites that's good enough, really has no bearing on what the bees can handle. Right, one of the things that I'll talk about later when I talk about small cell beekeeping is that uh, with small cell beekeeping we shift the burden of the mite predation over to the drones. And so the total number of mites in the hive doesn't change. In fact, it'll probably increase because mites can reproduce better on drones than on workers. But because the drones are the ones taking the hit, the hive can go along just fine. You know, you can lose half or more of the drones and it's not going to bother the hive at all. You'll still have plenty of drones to go out and mate with queens. So if I can have a hive that's gentle and productive and other traits that I like and just be dripping with mites, I don't mind. That's fine. They can have an incredibly huge mite load and they'll do just fine. Generally, the, the bees keep the mite load down, uh, and hives that, that are productive generally have a low mite load because they're keeping it under control and they don't have to deal with the problems. So, but 
that comes back to the point where I leave it to the bees to figure out and I don't worry about the details. My voice is going. I'm good though, it'll be fine. So uh, let's go back to um, the antelope and the cheetahs again. Because I leave it to the bees, that's kind of like um, if, you, if treating would be like putting an antelope on a trailer and pulling it across the savanna. You're going to outrun the cheetah, no problem, right? A cheetah can run 70 miles an hour, but can only do so for a few seconds. The gazelle can run 50 or 60 miles an hour, but they do it in zigzag, right? So we're dragging the, cheetah, the gazelle across the savanna on a trailer, you're going to outrun the cheetah. But that gazelle is going to be in no shape to outrun a cheetah if you get a flat tire. And that's what we're doing with the bees. I just like to give a few examples. You can kind of see it in your mind. Um, so we don't objectively know that less mites is going to result in a more healthy hive. And so that's why I don't worry about mite tests. Um, you can if you're, if you're specifically trying to develop resistant bees faster, you can worry about mite tests. Um, because you're, like with foul brood, burning the hives, you're eliminating the weaker of the species, the weaker members of the species. But I don't like to do that because I might, those hives might have more rare traits that allow them to survive with a lot of mites that others don't have. Um, so what, in, in, I, I always like to make these as much practical as we can. So. If we're, we're starting out treatment-free beekeeping, what are the things we want to keep away from? Right? The things we don't want to do, the things that are almost guaranteed to cause failure. I want to tell you about those ahead of time so that you don't make that mistake moving forward. Um, the number one is when people, and this is kind of nebulous, the people who go treatment-free, they basically just stop treating and that's the only change that they make. If you just stop treating, there's a good chance that a lot or all of your bees are going to die. That's up front. Because you're starting with those bees that are dependent on treatment. That's the important point. You're starting, if, if they've already been treated, they're dependent on treatment, you stop treating, they're gonna die. So there's other things that I'm gonna be talking about all today on how we can um, get get over that process because the process of becoming treatment free in in my experience takes about two to three years and it's not just about um, buying new bees to replace the bees that we've lost we want to develop resistant genetics we want to change our practices to to create a better environment uh, and we want to unnaturally increase the number of bees that we have so it gives us a greater chance, gives us more rolls of the dice to get bees that have the right number of traits, the right combination of traits at the right levels to allow us to be treatment free and with a natural loss rate. That's something I think is very important for people to understand. We, we often deal with a false dichotomy between um, treating saves bees and treatment free kills bees. That's not how it works. Bees die naturally anyway. The natural average loss rate in a year is somewhere around, anywhere between 10 to 30%. Average. Uh, if you get a bad year, a bad, a bad summer with no, honey, no nectar available to make into honey, you're gonna have a higher loss rate in the feral colonies. Um, and you'll see that when I talk later about uh, swarm catching. You'll see that the following year when you're catching swarms and you, there aren't as many swarms because a lot of the, the, uh, the less able colonies have not made it or the colonies that are in too small of a cavity to store enough honey for off years have not made it. So that's important to realize. If you look at the numbers from, I always recommend people go to the 
um, be informed natural sur national survey every year it should be coming out you'll start to see emails for it if you've done it before or maybe advertising advertisements on beekeeping websites and magazines and things go in there if you get the opportunity uh, give your input talk about uh, there's a there's a loss survey and there's also a management survey and so you can give all your management techniques and they take those numbers and they figure out what things work what things don't work one of the things that doesn't work we find out is um, removing drone brood from varroa there's no difference in survival rates between hives that have had drone brood removed and hives that haven't so people all the time are, are using the method of, of removing drone brood to destroy mites and it doesn't actually help and so I'm part of what I'm trying to do is is dirt simple beekeeping don't do things that don't work right you would you would think that that's obvious but we don't know what doesn't work until we have actual numbers because each one of us when we do something and it works or it doesn't work that's not a scientific sample we need a sample where we have a lot of people and they all try it and we find out whether the numbers actually bear it out because there's so many mitigating factors um, we might have a, a hive that doesn't survive because it's because a skunk gets it and, and eats the bees and and it becomes weak but we don't notice so unless we know from a broader sample we, we don't really know what works and what doesn't um, what time is it? 9.46. Does anybody have any questions before we go on? Again, you can interrupt me at any time. Yes? I, I Related to feral bees, mm -hmm. because it was my understanding that there really isn't a clear understanding of what the state of feral bees is now. Where do you find out more about the current state of feral bees? Feral bees is going to be totally dependent on your area. Um, so I can't tell you about feral bees in your area. From what I hear from Dave, there are plenty of feral bees around here. Um, the only way to tell is by doing swarm trapping, which I'll talk about later. And if you're finding swarms and bees in areas where there aren't kept bees, where there aren't hives, then you know that those are feral bees. And typically, feral bees can, if you catch them and put them in a hive, they'll survive without treatment, no problem. Uh, because they've had to over the last 20 years. If you catch a swarm and it, and it crashes from mites in October, then chances are good that that wasn't a feral hive. But um, if, you look, if you talk to people who, who do a lot of uh, backcountry sort of things and come across feral beehives, you can get a good cross-section of, um, of what feral so bees are available. Really actually only exclusively studying feral bee populations so um, get reliable data from Tom Seeley. Studied. Tom Seeley studied a little bit, yeah. I can't I can't cite the studies for you, but uh, yeah, he he's Seeley's done a lot of really good work that is kind of off the beaten path that you can learn some interesting stuff. Uh, I'll talk when I'm talking about catching swarms later there'll be a lot of his information from there. Yes. I have a quick question, which may possibly be answered the way the clock at which point out said, fine, we'll do it back. Sure. Uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, the no treatment beekeeping uh, doesn't maximize production. So you might see that the commercial growers don't want to do it. I don't know whether that's true or not. It just might, might be a statement that would be made. And at the same time, it's fairly obvious to me that it does minimize the amount of work that's done. And so that might also be an argument for the commercial growers to do it. And I'm just wondering whether you have a, a, an opinion about which of those statements is most true, or is it reasonable for commercial growers to be switching to no treatment because even though they get less honey per hive, they can run more hives with a given amount of hours per week? Yes, that is a, an important issue to address, and we do have a, a difficulty with that today, especially with the commercial migratory beekeepers that go out to um, almond pollination in California. As far as I'm aware, there are no treatment-free beekeepers that go to almond pollination. And I believe the reason for that is because um, bees are not meant to move, right? 
if you have a population of bees, they're going to be in trees here and there. And um, unlike Lord of the Rings, trees don't walk, right? They stay in one place. And so what that allows them to do with disease is absorb disease much more slowly than in nature. They would absorb disease much more slowly and develop resistance uh, in a more measured manner than when we have uh, the commercial bees. Because what happened when varroa was introduced in this country, thousands, millions of beehives are trucked from all over the country into California. I guess you guys are backwards, so I should, I should say this way, California, um, every year. And so what that does is that concentrates the disease and the, the disease vectors and things that spread into that one area. And then all those bees are then redistributed back into the country. Um, sorry, I'm trying to, yeah. Um, so I don't know of any treatment-free commercial migratory beekeepers. There are quite a number of treatment-free stationary beekeepers who are making honey, wax, and selling bees. So some good examples of those are uh, uh, D. Lusby in years past. Um, Michael Bush isn't totally commercial, but he has his bees stationary, and the way he operates his thing, uh, use, he has people come in to help him and learn and, and do it that way. Uh, another good one is Kirk Webster. I've, I've interviewed him on my podcast. He's in Vermont. Uh, another one is Troy Hall, and he's in, in the Champlain Valley there, too. Um, and then also the only commercial or the first commercial bee producer was Bee Weaver, and they went off treatments back in the early 2000s. Um, and they, but I think they migrate to just from from Texas up to uh, North Dakota and back. So that's a little bit, but not quite the same. And they they're not in the same sort of situation because they're kind of maintain their own territory. And, and the beehives, I understand, in North Dakota are much, they aren't concentrated in one tiny area. It's spread very widely across the, the alfalfa fields. Yeah, they spread them out for, for alfalfa and honey and stuff. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay. All right, well, it's uh, eight minutes to ten, so I guess let's, oh. There's been a discussion in a group of our beekeepers about this treatment free and it seems to be being discouraged because what they're telling us is that when we don't treat our hives, say I have four hives and I opt not to treat, that what that does is increase the mite load that my neighborhood beekeepers are going to have to deal with or diseases that my neighborhood bees are going to have to deal with. Um, how can I nicely say that you know natural selection is the best way to go without hurting anybody's feelings or you know just state facts and let it go with that and let them deal with it or have angry neighbors or you know where do we go from there? Well, uh, the best way to talk to your neighbors and friends is first of all be be gentle and deferential and don't call them names <laughs> that's always a good start um, but what you've what you've lit upon there is what what I call the uh, the, the mite bomb problem because that's one of the biggest pushbacks we get if you don't treat your bees they're gonna have huge mite problems they're gonna they're gonna start crashing from mites in the fall and they're gonna become a mite bomb, right? And that hive's gonna die out and the other bees are gonna come rob it and they're gonna carry the mites back to their hive, right? Many of you have heard this. I see lots of people nodding their heads. Firstly, after you've developed treatment-free bees or you've, you've uh, gotten treatment-free bees from someone else and incorporated them into your yard or you've started with, as I, as I recommend, starting with swarms, feral swarms, bring them into your operation those bees don't have huge mite problems. Uh, I haven't lost a hive directly from mites in 10 years. Um, they just, it's just not a huge problem anymore. So my hives typically don't die in, during winter 
when they do die, they'll die later on in the winter and there's the bees aren't flying to come rob the hive and by the time the hive is robbed the mites are all dead and so that's not a problem. What I do say is that those mite bombs are actually a product of non-resistant bees swarming out and finding a spot in a, in a log or a house or somewhere. So really unless you can treat all the bees, all the feral bees, which you can't, there's no way you can control mite bombs. And really the source of them is treated bees. On, a, on a, another note, I have not seen any conclusive evidence that mite bombs actually happen. Um, when a hive crashes from mites, many of the mites are lost. Or, or die because if we go back to our predator and prey relationship when a when a predator kills all the prey it collapses and dies itself that's not a balanced relationship <coughs> excuse me um, and there's one more point that's important <coughs> I can't remember right now, but the important thing is when, when talking to people, always be respectful, even when they make you mad. I know it's really hard. I've gotten into a lot of, a lot of arguments online, and that's why with our Facebook group, we, are, we, we enforce civility, absolutely, because <coughs> what we're trying to do is not just have discussions. We're trying to actually promote treatment-free beekeeping, and debates, debates don't convince anybody. They just entrench two opposing sides. So, um, but yes, the mite bomb thing is an important question and I think it's a question that if you want to be treatment free that you should address and answer and uh, deal with. He was first. Hang on a second. Yeah. Or him in, him in the back. Could you say that uh, it uh, would be a little unfair to the Health market honey customers and treatment free beekeepers were pushed aside because, I, I mean, from my experience, the customers are really happy about buying honey that hasn't been treated. Mm. Well, I don't, they're not going to be pushed aside, fortunately. They're, um, we who raise treatment free bees are able to charge a premium for our honey and, um, you know that's that's market forces so um, we're doing well and there's uh, there's always in some states it's different than others because of the state laws and some states are required to treat or required to have inspections or required to meet certain thresholds um, that other places aren't and it's it's come to the point now where uh, as far as I understand more than half of individual beekeepers are treatment free these days so we're not we're not going to be pushed out anywhere but yeah, that's, people want clean honey, and, and generally when people, when people find out that bees are treated, most people don't know that. Most of the public doesn't know that. So when they find out that bees are treated, they then look for untreated honey. Who is next? You? Oh, I just wanted to, um, so in the world where it's contentious, right? I feel like a recent middle ground, at least in my old bee club, is do a sugar roll every month so you have numbers. Mm -hmm. And then the part where everyone agrees to disagree is what you then do about it, but to track your numbers. That's very good. So I know that um, I was talking with Rebecca Masterman, who's in the bee lab, Marcus Bevex lab. Mm -hmm. They started doing that. They've been doing monthly mic counts for like the last year and a half, two years. And so she did have some like hard numbers, evidence that looked like lateral transmission, like what a mite bomb would look like, because like <coughs> the previous month there'd be low numbers and then suddenly there'd be really high numbers in like August, September, and there wouldn't be another explanation for that increase. Like mite bomb might be the best explanation for that. Um, and then another thing that she 
said to me that I had never heard anyone say before, but she said it like it was a fact, was Varroa had a deal with Apis Serana, who they had co-evolved with, mm -hmm. and that when a Varroa mite lays eggs in a worker cell in an Apis Serana colony, they'll take those eggs out. Mm -hmm. So their deal was that, like, don't touch the workers and we will Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Or <laughs> yes, um, with with the original Apis serrana, where where uh, varroa mites come from, the 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 mites go after the drones, and the drones have a hard capping, so the mite, the bees can't chew out the drones. Um, Is that true with mellifera? No. Apis oh, so mellifera, they. Uh, the drones don't have a hard capping, so um, the bees can chew out the mites and deal with the mites. So what I'll talk about later on with small cell beekeeping is making sure that we differentiate the, the, the worker bees from the drones so that the, the varroa will predate on the drones, which we can afford to lose, rather than the workers. There was one over here. Yes. That would be a viable option, the same that we do with um, with American fowl brood. Uh, it, I feel that it doesn't allow proper time for the bees to develop traits themselves because we have this thing called epigenetics. Um, epigenetics, the idea is that you're actually causing the genes in, in the DNA to be expressed differently between mother and offspring without any corresponding change in the actual coding of the DNA. So what happens that we see in, uh, with lab animals is that if you raise like a mouse on a, on a near starvation diet, the offspring of that mouse will now have greater efficiency in processing food where they haven't, they haven't changed, like they haven't evolved to be a more efficient mouse. They've just adapted in a way that allows the children to be more efficient with food because the parent didn't have food. And that works in bees as well. And so when we, uh, when we leave them to deal with it themselves, we can have some of those traits expressed in the, in the offspring without ever having to actually change the DNA. But yes, it, it, it does work that way, but it's, I don't feel it's the best way to go. It's not, it's not natural, it's artificial selection. Yes? Um, one of the things that I've seen recently is more looking into a, a more uh, balanced relationship with the varroa mite and things that might prey on the varroa mite, like pseudoscorpions. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems with treating being that your treatments are wiping out that beneficial, um, yes, you know, something that would be in the hive. Um, do you see any correlation with like new equipment that might not have that balance yet with survival rates, whereas a uh, older equipment might have leftover populations of, of pseudoscorpions or something like that? I haven't seen any any direct numbers on that, but we know that, um, for instance, uh, chalk brood, which is a fungus that that kills brood in the hive, uh, the chalk brood uh, fungus directly competes with the American fowl brood bacteria, right? So if we have a hive that has both of those in very low levels, we have no infection of either. And, and you know, if you want an infection, you want chalk brood rather than foul brood because chalk brood they can come back from better. 
But if we treat prophylactically for foul brood, like uh, many commercial beekeepers treat with teramycin or tylosin, you destroy virtually all of the American foul brood spores and you, you get rid of the, the chalk brood, the American foul brood can then come back stronger later when that treatment wears off. So uh, treating for American foul brood is almost guaranteed to get you American foul brood if you stop treating. I've, I've seen that. Then back first. What do you think of caging the queen to break the brood cycle? It's kind of like a treatment, but it's almost like the queen. Is that, would, that, would that be a step in the right direction? If you're just getting started, then yes. Uh, if you're just getting started and you're working with bees that aren't resistant or hygienic or anything, um, doing splits or caging the queen, breaking the brood cycle to give the bees a chance to, to develop those traits is, is a good idea. Over the long run, we like to get away from that. We don't want to keep doing that because it keeps being something that they need to have happen. Because ultimately our goal is to let them do it themselves. But yes, initially that's a good idea. Yes. I started the keeping last year with two local Italian nukes from our area and everything. I had been taught beekeepers of that area, which is West Virginia, not from Virginia, um, was if you don't treat, they're going to die. So I had the fall last year with two hives that looked pretty good. And I started to do research in every single treatment that I could find seemed to cause damage to the hive. And the idea was, if you treat, you better give them time to recover before winter. And I'm thinking, you know, what's the sense in that? Mm -hmm. And my, my question is, is, are the treatments themselves, you know, not just because it's creating resistant lights, is it the weakening of the hives, this overall health picture, if you will. You know, you're, you're throwing them off balance right before winter. You're actually weakening the hive because my understanding is, is the people who are treating are losing more bees ultimately than those who don't. I mean, I made the choice to not treat last fall. I managed to get the two hives through the winter. They're looking good right now, so I got lucky. I mean, mm -hmm. to treat and stop. But is that the case that you find that, that there's a balance that gets thrown off by the treatments themselves, and it just takes time for those bees to, to develop? Yes. Yes, exactly. There is no such thing as a, um, a side effect free treatment or a side effect free medicine. Uh, you can always overdose and I've, I've heard many cases of people who will treat and they first you know whatever mite strip they're using was not calibrated collect correctly and it causes an overdose and, cause, and kills bees or the bees abscond and run out of the hive and give it up. Um, even the softer things like uh, oils, uh, essential oils, if you think about it, um, wax is an oil, right? It's a, it's a lipid, it's a fat, it, it's, we have, we have things that are soluble in water and things that are soluble in oil. Um, so when you, when you put an essential oil into the hive, it goes into the wax and makes the wax softer and that can cause other problems that the bees aren't happy with. Uh, the acids, uh, oxalic acids and other acids that are used, they change the pH balance in the hive. So if you look at the actual numbers from the Bee Informed National Survey, um, and you can, you can argue different directions, you know, the, the Treatment-free beekeepers are often new beekeepers and so have a higher loss, but even the, the, the treated bees nationally this last year, I think, lost 30-some 30, 30 percent of their hives. Um, untreated bees lost 40-some percent of their hives. So it's not a one or the other situation. At the worst, it's a bad, slightly worse. But again, you know, there's more than half the bees are surviving, and that's good. We can we can work from those and and bring down the other side. Yes. Uh, just now looking into I guess treatment or you're talking about essential oils, but uh, the ones using hops and uh, I grow hops here from the Pacific Northwest, which there's huge hop farms there. Yeah, there is. Any evidence of bees that are near like hop farms that even though 
they would be self-treating, basically. I don't know of any. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we we're making a we're making a treatment out of those. But is is there any you know looking at the evidence of bees that are kept here, hot farms that are basically don't need treatment based on the visiting those plants? There is no direct scientific evidence that I'm aware of, no studies that have been done on that. We do see a lot of people who plant various things in their gardens to try and help with bees, and we have no problem with that. If you want to do that, that's fine. Um, but until we show some objective evidence. And the other, the other thing is that um, if the bees are self-medicating, and there's some people that say they're, they are, good for them. Um, but when we take something like oxalic acid or thymol or hops that grow naturally and we super concentrate them and put that in a hive to kill mites, that's unnatural, right? Um, so we are trying to leave, leave it up to the bees to do those sorts of things. So I encourage, if you want to plant anything around your hives, whatever, go ahead. Uh, but we call that gardening rather than beekeeping. <laughs> Yes. You were talking about speaking of the gardening, just for a second. You were talking about when they had grooming behavior, they mm -hmm. crawled on fuzzy plants. Mm -hmm. What's an example of how fuzzy? Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, thistle or the video that I saw. I don't remember exactly, but you've, you know, some plants. Um, yeah. Yeah. Plants that have, you know, little hairs on them. Yeah. And I don't, and there hasn't been any study on that. Like, this is the first time this has ever been seen in this video. And so this is something that hopefully the researchers will start studying here in the next year or two. But I, I've, I've said uh, before, there are, there are probably traits that the treatment-free bees are using to deal with diseases that we don't know of, we haven't studied. Uh, and it just so happens that we just discovered one, which is awesome. Yes. All right, so I'm learning now that I'm a new beekeeper, and because the means that they probably were treated, then I should be doing something to keep them off the treatments, not just not treating them at all. I mean, just haven't treated mine at all, and not knowing where the bees might pack How long ago did you get them? I got them last April. And they're still alive now? Yeah. Well, that's good. That's so great. Then they broke that cycle if they had been treated and I hope they Yes, okay. most, of the, most of the problems from residuals from treatment stay in the hive when the bees leave, which is why catching swarms is such a good idea. So if they've been treated with antibiotics, that stays in the hive. Any. Uh, any of the oils or any other treatments that are absorbed into wax, that stays with the original hive. So you don't have to worry about uh, treatments following the bees along. What you do need to be concerned with is the genetics. Um, so that's, if, if they've survived through the first winter, then, then you've gotten over the first big hurdle. And so now what you would do would be to to increase those and give, your give yourself a an extra roll of the dice this coming winter. Uh, and that's what I'll be talking about with uh, expansion model beekeeping next. Yes? Our question brings up one, if you don't get a package that leaves everything and you get a nuke, where you're going to get five frames out of that original hive, how much are they bringing in as far as treatment if you're trying to get away from them? It all depends on where you get the nuke from and how fresh the comb is. Uh, if you were getting a nuke that had been treated with antibiotics and you're planning on not treating with antibiotics, that could be a problem. That would be the most likely thing to go wrong. You would, you would catch American foul brood or European foul brood. Um, but generally, nukes are on better footing than 
uh, packages because they're, you're not starting with an artificial condition with a strange queen and a bunch of randomly mixed together bees. You're starting with an actual hive that's already operating. So that's a better option. Yes? At least according to my notes, you went off your notes. You said you're, if you're going to start the relationship of free, free beekeeping, these are the things you need to do. And you're going to go into that Yes, I guess I did. I not finish that point. Things you want to avoid. Things you want to avoid. Failure modes. Yeah. Yes, I did skip over that, didn't I? Oh, somebody asked a question and I never got back to it because I was right at the end of my talk. So, yeah, let me just tell you before we go, before we take a break, the rest of that list. Uh, number one was just stop treating, and do everything else the same. So that's that's a common failure mode. Uh, the other one is just replacing your bees every year with packages. Every year, if they die, just buying new packages. Because what you're doing is you're repeating what you did before, and you're going to have the same problem. Okay? And when I talk about swarms, you'll hear about how I'm... Uh, when, you, when you invest that much money in something and it keeps dying, that's really depressing. And it, it causes a lot of people to give it up, and I don't want that. Um, the next one is not capturing swarms. You, every beekeeper should be capturing swarms, whether it's uh, being on a swarm call list and, and going and, and getting them out of trees and stuff, or at least using your old equipment that's empty over the winter, setting it up for swarm traps in the spring. You catch some swarms in your area. Are you're you gonna. More about how to set those up? Yes, I have a whole talk on that. Yes. Uh, another failure mode is having too few hives. One hive is, is a bad idea. You want at least two. I recommend more like three, four, or five. Because what you can do is if you have one hive and it goes queenless, then you're going to be totally at the mercy of wherever you can get a queen from. But if you have two hives and one of them goes queenless, you can then add a frame of brood every week to the queenless hive. Eventually that problem will fix itself. And so you. Um, the more hives you have, again, that's more rolls of the dice that you can be successful with. And the last one is uh, not practicing increase. Everybody should know how to split a hive and know how to, well, again, catch swarms, uh, know how to, how to increase back from it, your losses, or, which I'll explain in the next one, expansion model beekeeping. I recommend increasing to get ahead of your losses rather than trying to catch up. So that was failure modes. Any other questions? We'll take a quick break and then come back and go again. All right. <laughs>